we're very glad to welcome Naidi with this uh, evening. It's been in the works for quite a while. We've been talking about this. And as I've said to a few people, I feel like I've known Naidi and her sister for decades. And actually, I think it is literally decades. <laughs> and for centuries, I think I've been saying centuries. It's really only decades. And <clears throat> they were born in Paris. And I was very fortunate to meet them through my family because they went to the same fantastic Armenian school called Mugnik in Paris, where people learn through <coughs> doing and through having fun, through projects, through theater, through art, through music, the way we should learn everything, frankly. Um, and uh, it, it also is a, a school that works, I think. The, the, the theory is something that actually works in practice. And, and Naidi, her sister, my nieces and nephew, and all that gang are, are living proof of that. I wish we could clone the whole thing. Um, but one thing that's happened with Naidi and then her brother, Gorim, who was with us, maybe some of you remember him. He taught Armenian for us for a year and worked in London. Uh, they've all done their apprenticeship here, except you, you need to come. <laughs> um, is that they have a, a very big desire to help Armenia, Armenians, and they do it in a variety of ways. Goryun is now working with Tumo. I think he's opened a new Tumo in Paris. Is that right? Uh, okay, maybe there's more to that. Um, but let's get back to Naidi. Naidi uh, has a variety of talents, and I thought she was going to be a jeweler. <laughs> that started out for a little while. But she has become a curator. She's an independent curator. She worked at the Gomidas Museum in Yerevan for um, many years. She was, until recently, the head of exhibitions and, ex and education at the Gomidas Museum Institute in Yerevan. So she's a curator and educator. As I said, she's born in Paris. Um, she's very interested in context for the things that she's curating. So she has an ethnographic interest, and she does ethnographic research, um, music history. And she leads educational workshops around Europe, as well as Armenia and the Middle East. And her lullaby singing workshop, which we'll have the pleasure of having tomorrow night, I welcome you all back tomorrow. It'll be downstairs, by the way. Um, it won, she was among the five best practice museum education programs in 2016. So you'll have a, you know, this will be a very special event tomorrow to have one of the five best in Europe. So, uh, chosen by, the, I, I just said Europe, it's chosen by the International Council of Museums. And for the 150th anniversary of Gomidas's birth, Naidi curated the exhibi exhibition pieces at the Gomidas Museum and the open air poster exhibition. I think you have a few pictures of that, don't you, on the, on the, on the show? The exhibition was called The Future Thinker in Gomidas Park. So please welcome Naidi Satadurian, who's going to speak to us now and show some great pictures. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. And thank you, Shoshan and Gabi, uh, to have invited me from Yerevan to come to London for this two-day event. Uh, to celebrate Komidas's Komidas 150th birth anniversary. Um, so unfortunately today there is a tendency both in Armenia and in the diaspora to kind of venerate Komidas as an idol, but also to give an etiquette of a victim of the Armenian genocide. So unfortunately it's very problematic because it's veiling kind of the depth and the quality of his true calling as an accomplished artist. Okay, so I was saying that um, both in Armenia and in the, in the diaspora, Omidas is um, generally venerated as an idol, like a saint. Uh, but he also has like the etiquette of being a victim of the Armenian genocide, even though he has survived in a way. Um, and it's very pro problematic because it veils the entire like um, heritage that he has left, and he's like prolific career as an artist. Uh, so my talk is not going to be very academic, you know, following the life chronologically, and is nor going to be like a talk praising and venerating him as an idol or making him like a victim of the Armenian genocide. I'm, I'm really going to talk about him as an artist and what, what he has done during his lifetime and what he has left as, as a heritage. 
And above all, Comitas was a friend, a really good friend to talk to, to play with, to argue with, to joke with, and to love. So we are talking about our friend, and it's our friend's birthday. <laughs> um, so during his, um, his uh, time, Comitas was one of the most erudite Armenian intellectual and artist. He had the best qualities of an intellectual, broad-minded, um, a person committed to defend his uh, values, deep knowledge, international network. Um, he had a rather short uh, life. He lived 66 years. Uh, he was born in 1869 in Kyotahia, which is uh, a town in the Ottoman Empire, uh, around 200 kilometers from Constantinople, today's Istanbul. Um, he, he devoted his, uh, his 18 years uh, to educate to his education and then he had only 15 years as a musician can you imagine just 15 years in his to have like a professional career but he has left an immeasurable heritage uh, that the others who have lived and had many more years of career uh, haven't uh, done so and during those 15 years he was both i mean both he was a composer an ethnographer <coughs> Um, a teacher, a choir master, a singer, all those disciplines are very different, uh, even though it's related to music. But he, did, he, he was equally involved uh, and he excelled in, both, in all of those disciplines during his, uh, his life. Um, so I'm going to give some key details about his earth and his heritage. So here on the screen we have um, an illustration, an autoportrait that uh, he did um, in a letter that he addressed to his uh, very close friend, Markei Papayan, who was a really good musician as well. And it's like the end of the letter where he just signed Apagama Tatsova, which means the future thinker in Armenian, and he did his autoportrait. And I decided to use this expression, the future thinker, um, as um, you know, a way to celebrate his uh, 105th birth anniversary. So the heritage that Comitas has left is very rich. During his short um, like career, as I told you, he, he was an ethnographer, a vartapet, I will tell you uh, what he did in the field of sacred music, a composer, choir master, teacher, uh, musicologist, and a friend. And so I'll, I'll cover all those thematic topics, and then afterwards I'll talk about Comitas today and what kind of exhibition I curated uh, this year. <coughs> so let's start with nature, uh, the village and the peasants. Um, we know that folk music is um, inseparable to the human condition. Centuries old oral traditions contain the stories and the voices of those who came before us. Woven together, the songs create a rich tapestry of the human experience. Um, and Comitas devoted his entire life to collect, to study and spread uh, the oral traditions that he collected um, in the most remote villages in Armenia. Uh, he participated in like the local ceremonies, the feasts. Uh, he spent days and nights with the villagers uh, to, uh, in order to be in the natural environment and collect uh, those oral traditions. Um, he often like walk on foot uh, and from one village to the other and um, collected uh, oral traditions right on spot and when the songs were created. And uh, for him, um, he didn't want to study music as, I mean, he didn't want to yeah, study music just for a, through a sonic perspective, like musical perspective, but he wanted to know the, the social context, the cultural context and the environment where those music, those types of music were created. Um, so he, he engaged in long and tireless and meticulous uh, ethnographic fieldwork, and he collected, um, it is said by his contemporaries, around 4,000 uh, folk songs and melodies. To this day, we have around 1,200 uh, musical pieces that have been published from his um, notebooks. Um, a number of his um, like music notebooks have been uh, haven't been preserved, 
because uh, when he survived from the Armenian genocide, when he came back to his home in Constantinople, his entire library had disappeared. So from the 4,000 pieces of folklore that he had collected, around 1,200 have been published to this day. Um, so Komida started uh, collecting folklore pieces when he, he was studying in Ejmiadzin. So from Kutaya, he moved uh, to Ejmiadzin to study at the Gevokian Seminary, which was kind of the big university at that time. And uh, his last ethnographic fieldwork, he did it in 1913. And in 19, from 1910, starting from 1910, he was already living in Constantinople. So just briefly, to give you an overview geographically, he moved, I mean, he was born in Kotahia, he moved to Echmiadzin, did a bit of you know, work in Echmiadzin and around, and then Tbilisi, and then he had the chance, he had a, a sponsor, let's say, to go and study in Berlin. Uh, so he studied there, he came back, he, he like um, started uh, teaching at the Georgian Seminary in Ejmi and then in 1910 he moved to Constantinople. The Armenian Genocide happened in 15, and then he moved to France. Uh, but during all those years, everywhere he was going, he was forming like choirs, he was, he was giving <coughs> conferences, so he was a very like international, uh, like a cosmopolitan kind of artist at that time. <coughs> so in this photo, we see uh, peasants um, plowing the, the, the field, right? Um, so it, it's in these kind of uh, environments where Gomitas with his notebook was going listening and collecting the songs. So he has collected a number of plow, plow songs, um, which is kind of uh, not unique in ethnomusicology, but uh, few ethnomusicologists have, you know, dig into this kind of work and labor uh, songs, and Komitas has collected a lot of them. Um, I can give you a short example. Um, maybe you could join if you know the melody, Le bon Jan. <laughs> So for example, imagine this happening and <coughs> such a song being sung. So imagine this kind of, you know, it's this kind of song being sung, like the animals in the fields. So this is like an, a, fra a fragment from a, a piece that he collected. So now we are in Lori, which is in the north of Armenia. It's a painting done by uh, Panos Teslamesen, who was a very close friend of Gomitas. They lived together actually in Constantinople, and um, their apartment in Constantinople <coughs> became like the best place where intellectuals and artists were gathered. Um, and um, Panos Teslamesen depicted like a typical kind of rural um, village uh, in Armenia, and actually in the village of Sanahin, Gomitas collected a, a number of masterpieces of folklore. Folklore. And um, it's exactly in this kind of context, you know, where women were working, uh, you know, <coughs> men were in the field, that Komitas was collecting the songs because those were the environments where, you know, peasants were improvising and singing. Um, now we have another um, canvas on the left. It's from Yerich Atade Vosian, again, a very close friend <coughs> of Komitas. They were together in Ejmiadzin. And um, here, he depicted uh, Komitas like when he's doing his ethnographic fieldwork. So he's behind a tree. Why is he hiding behind a tree? <coughs> because, <coughs> yeah? Maybe not for them to see him. Or yeah, not to disturb this <coughs> kind of natural scene yeah. happening, right? So he was either behind a wall, behind a tree, with his notebook on his hand, in his hand, and he was like just following whatever the peasants were doing, so collecting the songs, but also the dances. And um, he left those kind of um, explanations in some of his articles um, that he published. In the village, everyone knows more or less how to sing, for they 
all participate in the creation of a song, but nobody knows who concocted the song, but they all take part in the creative process. Nobody knows where it is composed, where it could have been composed anywhere. Nobody knows how it is composed. The creation of song is a spontaneous activity. Nobody knows when it appears, as every moment brings with it a new variation. So for example, this like cloud song, it has a number of uh, variations. The creation of songs for the peasant is as common as conversation. So uh, as you saw in like the previous canvas, you know, where, when people were working or you know, it was leisure time, it was like a form of discuss discussion, conversation. If one does not write down what is said, or if thoughts are not retained in our spirit, we will not remember them later. Each song is tied to a moment in village life and is related to just that moment. The peasant cannot comprehend, create, or utilize a song that is removed from that moment. So it's really about the moment. I kind of uh, give, when I work with kids, uh, like a, a comparison with photography, right? It's the, the art of capturing like a moment. And at, not, uh, at musicology and ethnography as well, it's what's happening at that moment precisely. Yeah, so during his ethnographic fieldwork, Comidas collected uh, four pieces through uh, those kind of notebooks that you have on the right. So those are exhibited in the museum, and the ones that you see on the left, they're kind of very dry, but on the right side, it's very clean, and you see like the Armenian notation and the lyrics. And at the end, on, at the end on the right, in the bottom, you also see the date. And sometimes, and usually, ethnographers also write the this, the place where they have collected uh, the folklore piece. And here on the left side, you see like very clearly the notation of this very famous song, Junt Bukhavir in Saren. Uh, again, um, like the top line is the Armenian new notation system. I'll talk about that as well. And then the, you see the lyrics, and then again a notation, and then the lyrics. Here are just two kind of etudes of Vartke who, when um, in 1915, 1916, Armenians from the region of Asparagan were coming to Echmiadzin, Surinians kind of did like very quick sketches of the peasants, the villages, so that, you know, he could uh, kind of have uh, the, the, the customs, uh, what they were wearing, and um, uh, he represented both men and women, and actually, we have a very funny story because on the left, uh, I mean, in 1915, Komidas was not in right? But on the left side, uh, Naho Kiri um, is um, one of the informants of Komidas. Uh, and Armenians have also like an epic, it's called David of Sasun. And um, some parts of that epic has been sung. So he recorded Komidas some uh, music pieces from this Naho Kiri. <laughs> <coughs> so I was I was told as I told you when Komidas was going to the villages and part participating in ceremonies, uh, usually people were also dancing, right? I mean, music and dance was you know <coughs> together. So Komidas also studied Armenian folk dances and he wrote a number of articles about Armenian folk dances. And on the left side, you have a very interesting uh, notation, actually, which is not what Komitas used, but it's been uh, invented by, again, an Armenian ethnographer, Sir Kuili Sisyan, and it's like the notation of the movements of, of circle dances that uh, Armenian uh, people dance. Those are just two uh, fragments from his uh, article. Dance is perhaps one of the most significant manifestations of human existence. It expresses the particular traits of a nation, especially its customs and the level of its civilization. The tempo of Armenian <laughs> dances does not remain the same from start to finish. They begin slowly and gradually go to medium speed and then to the lively, from which they slow down gradually going from the lively to the medium speed to the slow. Ethnic Armenian dances are circle dances. Here is how the dance is organized. The dancers choose a leader who is well known as a singer and a dancer. This position can be occupied by either a young uh, woman or a young ma man, while the dance group can be mixed or of the same gender. Dance is a phenomenon of quintessential significance for it combines all the other arts. Dance as movement has a very important role in education for all the arts, music, sculpture, architecture, and others are made of movement. There is dance in all of life. 
is not the life that the entire universe events. <coughs> Those are kind of uh, what we can find in his um, scholarly articles. Yeah, so also uh, Gomitas uh, was an ethnographer and he collected oral traditions he also, and songs. He also collected melodies, folk melodies. And he was also a flute player, and those are uh, three of his flutes from his personal collection. We have uh, different materials used, bamboo, metal, and apricot uh, wood. So, as I told you, 15 years of career is very short, but he also <coughs> ends he was a Vartabed, a priest doctor in theology, and he didn't have a lot of means. Um, but he has succeeded in publishing three um, uh, publications, and the fourth one is just a like a notation, a score. Uh, the first one was High Canard, published in Paris, then High Gertrugierke, the third one in Leipzig, and then on the right side, Melodie Kurt. Um, actually, when Gomitas was going to the villages and collecting uh, folklore pieces. Um, you know, if peasants were singing in Kurdish, he was collecting in Kurdish. If peasants were singing in uh, Turkish, he was collecting those as well. So he has a number of uh, Turkish and Kurdish um, folklore pieces as well. And this was um, just a supplement that was published in the um, Armenian ethnographical kind of journal, Emilian Azdevrakian Landes. So, we understood kind of how he did his ethnographic fieldwork. But Gomitas was also, as I told you, a Vartapet. He was a priest, doctor in theology, um, and uh, he was interested as well um, with Armenian sacred music, liturgical. And um, this is actually the first piece that he has, been, he has published. It's a national anthem, but it's, uh, it's an anthem that is sung in the church. Um, Sometimes, not you, not always, but uh, at the end of the divine liturgy. So this is the first work that he did, and again, you can see the Armenian notation is for choir. You can see the Armenian notation and the lyrics. Then his masterpiece uh, is um, the di the divine liturgy. Um, his arrangement, his composition uh, of the divine liturgy. He actually had like eight to ten different arrangements. Uh, the last one, um, which is like just for a male choir, is uh, said to be his masterpiece. Usually in the Armenian church, I guess in this church as well, uh, they sing the divine liturgy of his teacher, Makarek Malian. Um, Omitas's uh, divine liturgy, as I told you, is just for a male choir and usually it's mixed choir in the church here, and it's a bit more difficult but it's, it's a very original piece as well. Sometimes some of the songs, it depends who the choir master is, but they say, okay, let's do this song with the Gomitas version, for example. And this is actually the last piece that we know that has been published uh, of his compositions. Uh, it's, a, it's a prayer for the children that he wrote for the Nikolosian um, school in Constantinople right after returning from exile in 1950. It's a, it's a very simple piece, it's, it's written for children. So now let's talk about him as a composer. Um, in Armenia and also in the diaspora, different musicologists uh, kind of argue, I mean, are his um, musical pieces, compositions or ar arrangements, because uh, most of uh, the pieces that he has written, it's based on uh, folk music or sacred music. Um, so he has uh, composed in three different uh, uh, genres, uh, vocal music, qu uh, choir, and piano pieces. Um, and when he was studying in Berlin, he also uh, was inspired by, you know, uh, German uh, music as well, and uh, he composed also based on German texts. For example, this is a psalm uh, in German by the Waters of Babylon, and it's a piece that he wrote during his study years in Berlin. On the right, uh, it's actually a piece that is based on a, a Turkish Ottoman uh, poem 
that uh, Mehmed Emin Yudakul wrote. So Omitas not only composed pieces based on uh, Armenian folklore, but also based on other languages. Here is a very nice example. So he was a master of, de of, the, of details, and he was very neat. I mean, this is uh, handwritten. Uh, when you see it, like in front of you, you'll see how neat is it, it is. So this is one of his piano pieces, Unabi, and it's uh, I kind of zoomed here because um, you see the title Unabi. Then the first parenthesis it says from where he collected that melody, Vava Shapan, which is the old name of Etchmiansin. And then in the second parenthesis, you you see it's written Tari Yevda Pivojo, and it actually means how the musician has to, I mean the style that the musician has to interpret it with. So tar, it's a folk a string instrument, and the dap is a folk um, percussion. And uh, on the right side, he writes Giri Arab Dashnaket and his beautiful signature. So collected and arranged. So he writes arranged, not composed, uh, and then his signature. So of course, uh, while he was studying in Berlin, but afterwards as well, he uh, had planned uh, to uh, create um, operas as well. And uh, one of the um, projects that he started but that he didn't finish was the Anush opera. So now that if you go to Armenia, you can you know, uh, hear uh, this opera, but it started uh, to, write, um, to write pieces for this opera, but hasn't finished it. But he also even started writing the scenography. Like, the curtain opens, the stage is dark, nothing can be seen, the stars uh, in the sky slowly start to brighten, etc. So he was really willing to do this, but he had so many, you know, projects uh, ongoing that he didn't finish this. So um, everywhere where he lived, he formed a choir. And even when he was traveling, he formed, he formed like a choir. And when I say choir, it's not like 10 people or 15 people. It's about 100 or more. This is uh, in Constantinople, he is here. And we have 160 people here, members of the choir. But actually, the choir that he formed uh, in Constantinople was made of 300 members. Just imagine that. It's not <laughs> and uh, wherever he went in the Middle East, uh, in Egypt, in Turkey, in the Ottoman Empire, and um, in Armenia, uh, he formed like choirs with like a hundred people or more. Um, for those choirs, uh, he liked having like adults as male singers. As for like uh, um, women, uh, female singers, uh, he wanted to work with uh, children a lot, so that the voice is more pure and and bright. So those are just like posters of some of his concerts that he gave in different cities. So here it's in Etchmiadzin and here it's in Paris, I think. Yes. And as you can see in French, it's written uh, Musique Arménienne Populaire et Liturgique. So basically, when he was giving uh, concerts everywhere in, like, in each city, he was like, first of all, presenting Armenian folk music and after the break, he was presenting sacred music. So, and in all of his musicological articles, he writes that Armenian folk and sacred music come from the same source and they are like, like sister and brother. So here again, 190, right? Yeah, 190 members. We are in Egypt, in Alexandria, in 1911. And after this concert, his very close friends invited him for dinner. And on the left side, you have a very nice piece. I'm sorry for the quality of the documents. Uh, uh, actually, the, the menu of that dinner uh, that he his friend organized is uh, formed uh, uh, with like a, an acrostic poem, right? So when you read like the menu, like the dishes, it says Agrat Putinai Zug Urmio. So from uh, top to bottom, it reads Gomitas. Mm -hmm. So it's a very nice piece that was preserved and is exhibited at, in the museum. So Gometas, um, based on all his uh, ethnographic uh, activities, uh, he uh, wrote a number of very important um, scholarly uh, publications, articles. So he was uh, in Armenia um, 
till this day the greatest music musicologist, but in the world he is known as one of the pioneers of the field of ethnomusicology. So while he was studying in Berlin and in Germany at that time, um, in the field of, uh, in the academic field, ethnomusicology was not used, not yet. It was um, musicology comparé, which means uh, comparative musicology. Uh, but afterwards it became ethnomusicology and so with um, generally they compare him with Bella Bartok so uh, he, he really like pioneered this field here he is like giving a lecture in Paris um, on his right it's Louis Lallois who is a very famous French musicologist and he was invited uh, to give a lecture about Armenian folk music but also the Armenian notation system so the medieval notation system, I will show you a photo now, and the new notation system used by them. On the left side we have his like imitation card, where he uh, participated at the conference. And then on the right side we have a very interesting document that was, um, again, preserved. It's a French journal called M Musica. Uh, and we have a photograph of a church uh, ceremony, so the divine liturgy that is sung in the Armenian church in Paris. And Komitas is in the middle, and then Makai Papai and his friend, and Shah Radian and his other friend, pupils, uh, are singing. And this uh, liturgy was organized for the members of the, um, like the Congress, the international like, conference members. Uh, and it's like a cover page with a photograph, and the editor wrote a very nice piece in the church in Jongbujong Street, an Armenian liturgy was celebrated in honor of the members of the International Congress of Music. We heard musical works of an or original character that were interpreted by Mademoiselle Babayan, who trilled sacred vocals as a mystical doe, and by Mr. Shah Nadian, whose brilliant voice is of pure metal. So again, at that time, a number of uh, French, German, um, press and uh, very good uh, critics wrote uh, a lot about his uh, work as a musicologist but also um, as a musician and composer. So I was talking to you about the Armenian notation. Uh, here is an example taken from a manuscript uh, in Yerevan uh, where you see the medieval nomadic system which is called Khaz, Khaz Agrutyon, uh, which was used from the 8th century to the 16th century in the, um, the churches, the Armenian churches. And since in the church, uh, uh, hymns and songs were transmitted orally, you know, uh, century after century, uh, people couldn't decipher any anymore this notation. It's a very uh, rich notation and hard to um, to read, and it has changed throughout the centuries as well. So from the 8th century to the 16th century, it changed enormously. And since it was like transmitted orally, at the end of the 16th century, nobody could read that uh, notation anymore. Um, in the like 18th, 19th century, in Constantinople, a new notation was um, created. You remember his like notebooks, right? So that notation that was inspired by some of the uh, graphic, let's say, notes uh, and the European system. Um, but Komitas tried to study this notation and it's, it is said that in one of his letters or articles he's writing that he started deciphering this notation but only like the simple uh, melodies where the notes and the graphic elements are, are not that large. But uh, we have no, nothing left from his heritage in terms of what he deciphered, we just have this kind of testimony in one of his correspondence. Those are just examples of his articles that he wrote as a musicologist. So he wrote about Armenian folk music, sacred music, the notation system, Armenian dance. Uh, he even wrote about musical therapy in this uh, journal, the Almanac. So he was a very good teacher as well. When he was in, in Echmiadzin, he had a lot of pupils, but when he moved to Constantinople, uh, he had in mind to create a, a conservatory. So imagine 15 years of career, he had those <laughs> projects in mind. Um, he didn't succeed in opening um, a conservatory, but he had five very important pupils, and those are his uh, students. On, on the right side, it's his secretary, but the other ones are his students. 
and all of them, beside Hayek on the left side, he lost his voice during the war, continued um, in the, had musical careers as well. Some became composers, others uh, became ethnographers. And I would want to just focus on this guy, Mehran Tumajan, because uh, he became the first ethnographer in the diaspora. So right after the genocide and uh, the world war, uh, he, he then moved to Paris and afterwards in New York and Boston and he did what Gomitas did in the villages but in urban cities. So from the um, survivors of the Armenian genocide he went like knocked the doors and collected folklore pieces but in apartments and homes in Paris, New York and Boston. So he as well collected around a thousand pieces of uh, folklore and what's very unique is that since Gomitas did his field work in Armenia, so more in the eastern part, he collected a lot of folklore from the Eastern kind of uh, traditions. But uh, Mian Tumajan, he collected from the survivors of the Armenian genocide, so those are more fr coming from uh, historical Armenia, so the Western part. Could you repeat his name? Mian Tumajan. And he, in, when I was, I did an exhibition about his, his work, and when he, uh, I, I found a very nice piece where he's writing about the five students, and at the end he's writing about their teacher, and he writes, the five of us have been Komitas' pupils, we are greatly influenced by Komitas Vartapet, we have many influences from his personality, and I think that in our current situation, when the five of us get together, perhaps by squeezing and squeezing, the little Komitas might mm -hmm. come out. As for the future, I hope a new Komitas will be born. And uh, those five students, when after the World War and the genocide, when they came back to Constantinople, because they came back to Constantinople, they formed a union the five pupils of Komitas. On the left side, it's like the kind of the project uh, of this union, and on the left, right side, we have kind of very nice sketches of like a logo for the union. So Komitas was a very good friend, and he had a very wide circle of friends, uh, both in Constantinople, in Echmiadz, in Tbilisi, in France and Berlin, and even in, he came to the Isle of Wight here in England. Um, and uh, <coughs> he was a very funny guy. Like he, he really liked making jokes and dancing. And those are the types of testimonials that his contemporaries left. So Raja Jano was his really good friend, a very good linguist. He said he was a hardworking, with a strong will, sincere, kind, friendly, sweet, and modest to it all. He was a brave dancer. And in addition to his musical genius, he also had side talents, like being a poet and a clever comedian who was well known for his jokes. So as, I'm, as I was telling you, today and even during the Soviet period, a number of artists and writers and the general public is always representing Komitas as a very sad person, in the, like the sculptures of the poems that, that's written about him. But he was actually a very funny and you know, simple, modest uh, artist. He liked drinking rose petal tea. Uh, he liked calling his um, really close friends. Um, uh, in Turkish, he was using the word kertenkele, which means uh, lizard. So he had like a very nice bro um, brooch uh, with a lizard on his like um, how do we call the church uh, cassock? The cas yeah. You know, so very simple guy and very sweet. And uh, he also left some graphic kind of uh, sketches in his letters when he was sending to his friends. So these are the faces. Mm -hmm. This is himself. He wrote SNESM and this is me. <laughs> <laughs> these are other people <laughs> that he liked or didn't like. <laughs> And this is him. And um, so I use this like uh, auto portrait and expression of Agama Datsova, the future thinker, to create an exhibition dedicated to his 105th anniversary. And what I wanted to uh, focus on was uh, how contemporary artists and designers are uh, looking at his heritage. So I kind of gave Carte Blanche to around 15 artists from Armenian diaspora, and they created. Uh, 
posters, like large scale posters, that we exhibited in the, the, in the garden in front of the, the museum, which is actually um, also near the Pantheon where his uh, remains are, are buried. Uh, and um, everyone used different techniques and were inspired with you know, different uh, aspects of his work. Um, I just put some.